Welcome to the International Sunday School lesson for Sunday, April 30th, 2023. The title of this lesson in voice commentary, as well as Towson's Press International Sunday School commentary is, A Promise is Made to Jesus' Disciples. Hey, if you enjoy our lessons, please let us know by liking, commenting, subscribing, and hit the little bell to be notified when we post each week. To find out more about Jordan Christian Center, a virtual ministry aiming to transform lives by equipping, educating, empowering, as well as encouraging the world, please visit us at jordanchristiancenter.com. Hey, I'm Minister Adam, and Sunday School is now in session. And before we get into our lesson, let's start with a moment of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we ask that you be with us as we go through your word, Lord. Lord, as we glean from your son, Jesus Christ, Lord, we aim to be more like him and less like our flesh, Lord. Guide us as we go through your study, and it's in your son, Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's get into our lesson. Our scripture will be coming from Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 11, and we'll be in the New King James Version of the Bible today. And the main thought will be coming from Acts chapter 1, verse 8, which says, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, and in all Judea and Samaria, and the end of the earth. As we do each week, we'll start with a little bit of background. We're now in the ninth lesson of the third quarter in the unit titled, Experiencing the Resurrection. And this week's lesson is coming out of the book of Acts. Now, the book of Acts is the second of a two-part work, both traditionally attributed to Luke. Now, the introduction of Luke chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, also explain the reason for the book of Acts is to create an orderly record. See, Luke is more than likely um, the only Gentile, which means he's a non-Jewish author in the New Testament writing. And he's emphasizing God's plan to all people. He also wrote, of course, the book of uh, the Gospel of Luke as the first segment of this two-part work. Now, in Acts, Luke picks up where he left off in, um, in the book of Luke, where the gospel ends, starting with the ascension of Jesus and continuing on to the end of Paul's first um, imprisonment in Rome. That was around uh, 62 AD. Now, the book of Acts was written to provide the his history of the early church. It, the emphasis of this book is to fulfill the Great Commission. Acts record the apostles being Christ's witnesses in uh, Jerusalem, Judah, Samaria, and the surrounding world. Then the book of Acts sheds light on the gift of the Holy Spirit who empowers, guides, teaches, and serves as a counselor. Reading the book of Acts, we're enlightened and encouraged by the power of the, of the gospel as it spread throughout the world and transformed lives. We actually get to witness the, the disciples going out and doing what Jesus tells them to do in the power of Christ through the Holy Spirit who guides them. The, apostle, um, the apostles here, they perform many miracles during this time to validate their, messengers, uh, their message from Christ. Now, leading up to our lesson today, we find that Christ had completed his earthly assignment. He was sentenced to death by crucifixion, where he laid down his life for our sin. No one took his life. He laid down his life for our sin. After hanging on that cross, we find that Jesus was buried in a rich man's tomb. And on the third day, he got up with all power and authority in his hand. Now, after the resurrection, Jesus visited the disciples who witnessed his resurrected body. He spent some time with them, even cooked breakfast um, for them um, as he reinstated Peter back into the fold. You know, the Peter that denied him three times after the crucifixion. And this is where our lesson picks up in Acts chapter 1, verse 1, which says, the former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began to do and teach. So the first thing we need to remember here is the book of Acts is a continuation of the gospel of Luke. Acts picks up right where Luke 24 ends. Now, it's crucial to remember that since Acts is a continuation of the gospel of Luke, um, it is about what Jesus began both to do and teach. It, it continues the history Luke is presenting here. Luke addressed both the gospel in, in, in Luke and in Acts. These are addressed to Theophilus. 
Theophilus is probably a, a, a Gentile or non-Jew who had a, a, a title uh, and was honored as most excellent. We find this in Luke chapter 1, verse 3. This implies that this man was wealthy and some type of governmental influence here. So Luke mentioned the word, uh, the word began. This it would indicate that the Lord still teaches, and even to that day. So even though Jesus has been ascended into heaven um, by this time, he's saying that Jesus still taught. That was just the beginning, but he continued on to this day. And our next verse is verses two and three. This is actually the last um, words of Jesus before his ascension into heaven. It reads, until the day in which he was taken up, after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostle whom he had chosen, to whom he also performed himself alive after his suffering by many uh, inflatable proofs, being seen by them during the 40 days and speaking the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. When we look at this, verse 2 speaks of a period between the resurrection of Jesus Christ and his ascension. See, the ascension of, of this taking the Lord's physical body into heaven, the resurrected body is being taken into heaven. That's his Jesus' ascension into heaven. Now, after the ascension, the Holy Spirit will enable the apostles to understand the commandments that the Lord gave them while they were on earth. Now, we understand when Jesus was uh, uh, ascended into heaven, there's a 50-day period in, uh, before the Holy Spirit uh, uh, descends from heaven, and we call that the Pentecost. Now, during Jesus' post-resurrection re resurrection life before the ascension, Jesus taught the apostles principles that was important to their lives um, that, that, that he, they would need without the physical presence of Christ. When you look at this, Jesus had been with them for three and a half years, with them every day, eating with them, drinking with them, teaching them. But now Jesus is saying that he must go so the comforter will come. So in that 40 days after Jesus' resurrection, he was really teaching them the importance of of what he taught them. He was teaching them that the Holy Spirit would comfort them and guide them, but he must go. And Jesus also established the fact that his resurrection, um, that, that there's infallible proof of, of he actually was resurrected. What, what does that mean? That means they can't say, oh, he was a ghost or something like that. No, he physically came back in his resurrected body. He showed himself to the disciples as well as the 500 witnesses. So people may know there's proof that he was resurrected. That was very important. And he showed them this in that 40 days before his ascension. Therefore, they've seen that they know that Jesus was born in, and he was all man, yet he was all God. They've seen him do the works in his physical body. But then after his resurrection, he came back and he showed them that he yet lived. All of this during those 40 days um, before his ascension. Jesus left no possible doubt of his resurrection that he said that he's doing exactly what he promised. He promised to return in three days, and that's exactly what he did. The teaching Jesus gave during this period after his resurrection and before his ascension it, it is actually not recorded. But we are told that he used this time to speak the things pertaining to the kingdom of God to help the apostles understand more and more about him. Now, as we move down to verses four and five, it actually discussed the ascension of Jesus. It reads, and being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, I have, you have heard me, for John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when we look at here, verses four and five, it demonstrates that the coming um, baptism by the Holy Spirit is essential to the advancement of the gospel. Even to this day, it's the Holy Spirit that dwells in us, that make us, that strengthen us and guide us. So while Jesus is not physically with us, we have the same thing that the apostles will have to, to do the things in the power of Christ. And that is the Holy Spirit. 
Now, verse four is it, it is one of those occasions where Jesus is appearing after his um his post resurrection appearance here. So here it's saying that while while the disciples were assembled, Jesus challenged the apostles to depart from um, Jerusalem when the Holy Spirit comes. But they need to wait there. Jesus had nothing else for the disciples to do but wait till the Holy Spirit come. That's it. Wait for the promise of the fathers. See, Jesus knew that, that they really could not do anything effective in the kingdom until the Holy Spirit come upon them. That was true back then, and it's true right now today. Without the Holy Spirit, we can do nothing for or in the kingdom. It's the Holy Spirit that guides us in the way of the Lord. And we understand the Holy Spirit comes upon us when we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior. We believe that he died on the cross for our sin. When we are saved, the Holy Spirit enters us. Now, the apostles here, they needed to remain together to experience the beginning of the church. And that, again, was the day of Pentecost, which was 50 days after Jesus' ascension. This will be the day the Holy Spirit will dwell into in, in every believer and launch the church as we know it today. The church being the bride and the body of Christ. The apostle had nothing to do but wait. N nothing more. Nothing less. They had to wait. See, there's something about waiting on the Lord. To wait mean that there's something worth waiting for. To wait mean that they had a promise that it will truly come. To wait mean that they must receive it and they couldn't they couldn't create it by themselves. They could do nothing but wait on the Holy Spirit. See, long before the disciples were left to wait on the Holy Spirit, what comes to mind is the prophet Isaiah who told us some of the benefits of waiting on the Lord. In Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31, he said, But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength, they shall mount up on wings like eagles. They shall run and not grow weary. They shall walk and not faint. And that's what the, um, the disciples was waiting on, the Holy Spirit, to strengthen them. See, Jesus told them that just that he had been baptized in, in, in water by John the Baptist, they will, and that means to be fully submersed in water, that they will be fully submersed in the Holy Spirit. Now, as we move down to verses 6 and 7, we find the disciples have a question for Jesus. And it reads, Therefore, when they came together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know times or season which the Lord has put in his own authority. Here we find that after Jesus said that they will be baptized in the Holy Spirit, the disciples had a question right here. The question that the disciples asked showed that they still did not quite get it. The, the disciples did not have any idea that the Lord was about to launch this church instead of the kingdom. He was going to launch the church so, so they can spread the gospel so when his kingdom come back, he can take as many people as possible with him, anyone that confessed that Jesus is Lord. Now, the Old Testament did not reveal, reveal to in, the interval between the two comings of Christ. And this is what their misunderstanding was. Christ came to, from heaven to earth to, to save us. But... He will return to bring us unto him. That's what's the difference. But this is not mentioned in the Old Testament between the time where Christ will come to earth to save us and the time that Christ will return to bring us to be with him. So the disciples here didn't, didn't quite get that. They still function with the idea that the, of the promised material kingdom will come in their day. They envisioned the day of the Masonic political power and splendor. Maybe they thought the Messiah would conquer again the, the Roman Empire. Instead, Jesus had an entirely different plan. He had the covenant of the church where the Holy Spirit will dwell in the body of the believers to form the church, the bride of Christ. 
He would institute the church and then later establish his kingdom on earth on his second return. In verse 7, Jesus replied that it, that it is not for us to know and, or, or to totally um, negate the kingdom, but he said that there will be a delay before the millennial will come later on. The restoration of the kingdom was still a future event. They thought it would happen then, but Jesus was letting them know it's a future event. So instead of denying that the kingdom will come here, he said that the timing, they will not know. And only God has the authority to know that no man will know. So Jesus, in this point, made a conclusive statement about the era of, of date setting. That, that anyone, anyone, I want to make sure we clear, know the time in which the Lord will return. Our Lord did not deny that he will eventually establish the kingdom here. However, he wanted his followers to know that, that, that this new church, that the new thing, the new covenant, the church, the body of Christ, that uh, is not the same as the kingdom. That's still to come. But that also means that anyone that prophesied the date in which Christ will return to take us to be with him for all eternity is a fraud. No man knows when Christ will return. And that's what he's telling the disciples here. Only the Father had the authority and the knowledge of that. Now in verse 8, Jesus discussed that they will receive the Holy Spirit when he returns. Verse 8 reads, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be a witness to me in Jerusalem, in all of Judea, in Samaria, and to the end of the earth. Look at this. Verse 8 starts with but. But here is contrast um, between verses 8 and verse 7. See, the instead of knowing the duration of the times and the kind of times or when, um, when Jesus returned, the disciples' mission instead is to witness to a faraway place, to, to parts of the earth that, that they won't even know they witnessed to. In fact, it's their witnesses that started others to witness, that made it all the way here to the United States and all around the world, to the witness to Jesus Christ being the Lord of Lord, the King of King, and the Son of God. See, although it's, it is improper for the apostles to know when the Lord will return and launch his kingdom. They needed to understand that what he what he's going to do in just a few days. In, in just 50 days, they need to know that, that, that he's going to do something. And he, he, they need to understand that Jesus will give a new program for the apostle in, in, in his unique mission we find here in verse 8. This verse says that our, uh, this is our Lord's final commission for the church in that the Holy Spirit will be submerged in them and do the following. The Holy Spirit will give them power. It, the Holy Spirit will in, in, endorse power to accomplish Christ's mission in believers. And, and this power was given by God to witness the gospel. That's what we get. We get power and strength so we can be witnesses to Christ. So we can endure all the fiery dots of the enemy. So we can understand the ways of the Lord. The Holy Spirit will give them power. The, the power uh, that the Holy Spirit will give the apostle will come from the Holy Spirit after Jesus' ascension. This power will commence and continue through the church, through all ages, all the way through the rapture. So Jesus will be ascended into heaven. The Holy Spirit will come to be our comforter and will remain with us all the way through until Christ returns again. Jesus at that time gave four geographical names showing the broadening scope of the mission of Christ to the world. It shows how the commission start in Jerusalem, right where they were, spread to Judea, and then to all of the world. That see, they were not to bear witness to themselves, though. That's important. They're not talking about how good they are and how great they are and how they, they must be something special because they spent time with Jesus. No, that's not what they're witnessing here. They are to witness the power 
of Jesus. That's what their witness is. The apostles' uh, ministry was to witness about Jesus Christ. Their mission started in Jerusalem, the capital of Israel, then spread throughout Judea. Judea is the providence in which Jerusalem was located. It's where many of the Jews lived, right there in Judea. Then spread to Samaria. Samaria is the next providence um, north of, of Israel. It used to be called the Northern Kingdom of Israel. Samaria, though, had both Jews and uh, Gentiles. They, they had half-breeds, what, what the Gentiles were called. I'm sorry, the Jews would call them because after um, the exile, when they came back, they actually started many of the customs and so on and so forth of the Gentiles. So the Jews did not really associate with those in Samaria because they considered them half-Jews. Half-Jews, uh, half-Jew, half-Gentiles. So they were to spread the word to not only the Jews in Judah and and um and Jerusalem, but they also to broaden it out to Samaria, to where they have half Jews and Gentiles, and then lastly spread it out to the rest of the world, which would have been considered Gentiles or non-Jews altogether. So this word started small and it grew from there. It grew to all the surrounding areas of of Israel, and then it grew all around the world as we know Christ ourselves right now. These, version, these verses is important. It's the last commission of Jesus Christ while here on earth. Our lesson then moved down to our final verses, verses 11, uh, 9 through 11, in which Jesus ascends into heaven. It reads, But now when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly towards the heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing into the heaven? This same Jesus, who was taken up from you in heaven, will soon will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. When we look at this, Luke writes this to show the events historically, meaning that it actually happened. It, meaning that it, this is a, a, an historic event. The, the, the disciples watched Jesus ascend into heaven. This is no myth. This is no legend. They were eye, eyewitness to this. Five times in these verses, we have references to the apostles looking and gazing as the Lord went into the clouds. In the Gospel of Luke, as well as the book of Acts, stress the verification of the events related to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, by eyewitnesses. Now note here. This doesn't believe, just because there's an historic event here, it doesn't mean that some people won't believe it. In fact, we we'll find many people, even to this day, call it nonsense. And it doesn't mean that some who believe it happen believe in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. As a matter of fact, if we look at John chapter 6, Jesus spoke to those who witnessed his miracles, and he tell them he came from heaven and that he is the only way to have life with God. Yet, some still didn't believe. And now the Son of God has gone from this earth. This is what this, this verses are saying. The Son of God has gone from this earth. He, he had returned to heaven in his resurrected state to sit down on the right hand of the Father as a reward for his faithfulness. We find this in the book of Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, as well as Revelation chapter 3, verse 21. But here's the thing, the disciples still remained on earth. And, and they might have felt alone at that time. They, they may have felt that Jesus left them. But we find that these two angels told them, instead of looking at what you lost, now go do what you were commissioned to do. The, the, the two angels pushed them towards action. Stay away from the dwelling of the departing Christ and go and do what Jesus tell you 
to do. Because as Christ is, is has ascended into heaven and he sits on the right hand of the Father, now he's advocating for us. Now he's our lawyer. He's the one that's justifying us. And just so you know, justification means you did it. But because the death has already happened, meaning Christ, the wages of sin is death. Now, we don't have to suffer death because Jesus already did it. He justified us. Now, Christ is at the right hand of the Father advocating for us. The angel is telling them, now you go out and do what Christ tells you to do while you are still here on earth. And guess what? They won't have to do it alone because the Holy Spirit, which we call the Comforter, will guide them and protect them in the ways of the Lord. See, as the disciples we find here watched and and and, and lifted their eyes up to, to the sky as Christ disappeared into the cloud, these angels tell them, don't know, go watch that. Because that's going to make you think you're alone. And you're not alone because Christ promised that the Holy Spirit, the Redeemer, will comfort you. Instead, get busy doing what Christ has told you to do until that day that he returned. Now, it must have been quite an experience, brothers and sisters, to see Jesus ascend from earth and, and, and depart into the sky. On the other hand, this must have been a mighty welcome when Jesus returned to all the glory from his finished works in the redemption of mankind. A finished redemption was never true before Jesus Christ, what he did on the cross. We lost our relationship with God until Jesus came back and redeemed us. He paid a ransom for us with his life. And now that he died on the cross, now that he's been resurrected and walked among them for 40 days, and now that he's ascended into heaven, Jesus is showing us that now he sit with the Father. And I love it because Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will bring all men unto me. So we don't have to be sad about what Jesus did. Instead, we can rejoice because he gave us the connection we need back with the Father. Now, now that he resides with our Lord in heaven, consistently intervening on our behalf, positionally, that means that Christ is, it, it seated the believer, believers in heavenly places. He, he's taken our concerns. He's he made it so we can, we can lament to God. We can take our concerns to God. We can place our burdens on him. All of this is because what Christ did for us. Yet, Christ knew that we still need his presence here on earth. We still need his guidance. He understood that we still can't do it by himself, by ourselves. So he sent the Holy Spirit to comfort the disciples back then and us right now. That, brothers and sisters, is the good news. And we are still here to finish. We are here to, to uh, fight the good fight. We are here to tell some, everybody about somebody who can save anybody. Amen. Brothers and sisters, until next week, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn towards you and give you peace. I'm Minister Adam, and you have a blessed week.